Welcome to Unexpected Journey, the show where each week, top professionals share work wisdom and life lessons about their careers and what they have learned about human experience in the workplace. I'm your host, Anne Bibb. This week, we have Liz with High Operator. Liz went to MIT at the age of 15. Uh, where she built robots and 3D printers. And after completing her Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering at MIT, she went back and got her MS at the MIT Media Lab. And Liz worked in the physical commodities trading industry in Geneva and Singapore, because she's just an underachiever, clearly. And then she went off and founded High Operator in 2016. High Operator is a customer service as a service solution that allows businesses to handle client tickets faster and more accurately through the power of human and AI technology. Welcome, Liz. We're so happy to have you. Thanks for having me, Anne. Super excited to be here today. I'm so excited. And, you know, very much because of what's happening in the world, you're the perfect guest to have here because there's a lot of talk right now about AI and automation. And let's start out with what is the difference between automation and AI? You sound a lot smarter when you say AI, don't you? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so we really think of it as AI is a subset of automation, right? Automation is kind of the goal. It's how do you automate things and make them better, faster, more effective, more compliant, and all of that. And AI is really one tool among a tool belt of many things that you should have in order to accomplish this end goal of automation, right? And for that reason, we often say automation before AI. Right. There's a lot that you can do with simple, sim simple integrations, simple triggers, simple automations before you really think about using AI, which is relatively co computationally expensive versus just hooking two things together and telling them to go. That is very helpful because I think that there's a lot of confusion out there, especially around AI today. So we're hearing a lot about chat GPT. The internet has just been a buzz about it for the last few months. Uh, people are really mainly falling into one of two categories. They're either geeking out and truly excited about it, and they just want to play with it um, and see what it can do, or they're absolutely terrified. Of it. I've seen, I saw it, actually somebody the other day say that they were losing sleep and throwing up because they were so scared about what this meant for them and what it meant for jobs and what it meant for the future. Where are you on this? What's your take here? Yes. So we are squarely in this super excited, you know, innovation should be celebrated. There's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Now, what I will say is that, you know, there's the exciting innovation part. I do think that this is maybe a little bit similar to the first wave of 3D printing where everyone went, we can do layer by layer manufacturing. Where's the replicator gun coming in? Right. Let's build a um, heart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can 3D print tissue. That's awesome. You're not quite at, you know, 3D printing a heart quite yet. Right. In the same sense where, you know, we have a lot of, you know, lane assist and, and you know, enhanced cruise control. And there's a lot of, you know, self-driving tools there. But that's exciting. It's things to celebrate. It's going to make humans better and safer and more effective at what they're doing. But you're not really anywhere close to that sense of full um, general AI quite yet. The way I've always thought about it is that AI is really an assistive measure to helping, let's put it in the contact center view, right? Like we can take some of the easy stuff off of their plates with AI and let it handle the repeatable, easy things so that things that need human empathy and human thought process they can handle that and let AI handle those easy things. And that from an EX and CX perspective, that that will make things easier. 100%. I think it all comes down to where are the places where software can get you the most leverage? And I think in the contact center environment, you have a lot of things that are similar like that, right? And, you know, some examples of this we've seen are, you know, things like Grammarly, right? You know, Ooh, Grammarly is a good one. Yeah, exactly. It can go and read that, you know, six paragraph reply that you've drafted up and tell you exactly where you're mis making grammatical mistakes, right? And ChatGP3, in some ways, I think as 
the next level of that. They can read and whatever you think you want to write, and they can make it look better. But what it can't do is know all the policies and processes that you as the agent know, and you know you want to do because it's a very general tool, right? It's not customized to whatever you're supporting or the brand that you're working on. It also doesn't know what the other person on the end of the line is going through. You know, it doesn't know that, you know, your dog is sick or that you had a crappy day or that somebody rear-ended you on the way home and that you're in a foul mood. It doesn't know these things. So it can't adjust tone to accommodate for them. Yes. You as an agent, you need to decide intent and you decide what's happening. And then something like chat GP3 is kind of the filter that can make it better, yeah. right? Cameras have gotten a lot better. Your selfies have gotten a lot better than the Polaroids. Thank we gosh. Have. And the and filters. Then, Thank goodness yes. for the filters. Exactly. And then the filter is what perfects it, right? It that's takes how eight we... years off of our lives, right? I mean, that's what yeah. they're for. That's what the technology is for. Yeah. And the same the customer service perspective, right? You decide as an agent what you want to do for the customer, you know, enforce the policies. And then ChatGP3 takes a response and makes you an award-winning novelist. That, you know what? The more that I think about this is that um, it really is making it so much that it's going to take such so much of the easy stuff off of the plates that's kind of changing the job of what a customer service agent will be in the future. Well, we the way that we like to think about it is, you know, making a decision on what to do, whether you're going to, you know, go above and beyond for a customer, whether you're going to send them something special or make a policy exception, that is a fast decision for a human to make. And it's also an appropriate decision for a human customer service agent to make because they have all that degree of intuition that AI doesn't have, right? But things like ingesting a ton of text data or creating, you know, well-written, grammatically correct, well-phrased sentences, that takes humans a relatively long amount of time, but software a relatively short amount of time. So that's where you really want to double down on using AI to make the human better, faster, stronger. So by this logic, though, we are changing the scope of what, you know, theoretically, right? I mean, this is all theoretical right now, but if we're able to accommodate this with AI, take the easy repeatable things off of a customer service agent's plate and let them handle the things that need the human touch, then by that logic, this should not be a minimum hour or wage job any longer. We, now we're gonna talk about pay policy, right? Like we're no longer thinking $7.25 an hour position for a customer service agent. Yeah. Because it's all about leverage, right? I think the reason why tech is so powerful is that it allows people to create leverage, right? Software developers create a lot of leverage in their roles because every line of code that they write can be duplicated and it does a lot, right? I think there's something to be said about that same model in the customer service sense, where customer service right now is a you know, series oriented task. We do an interaction, you do the next interaction, you do the next interaction, right? And there's in some sense, a limit to how much leverage you can have in that and how many, you know, tickets or phone calls you can take a day. There just really is physically a limit. You know, when we think about what automation does and where you're able to roll that in, we think of the future as you, the customer service agent, you're supervising 10 cyborg agents, right? You're supervising cyborg 10, agents, yeah, automate agents where they can't do everything, but they're doing a lot of the work for you. And then you, as the human customer service agent, you're stepping in and putting the finishing touches on, determining intent, doing things like that. So you're not producing one agent's worth of work. You're producing 10 agents worth of work with the use of automation and technology. That's fascinating. As that's a, an exciting like, future. Like it, that's an exciting thing. How far away do you think we are from something like that? I mean, is, is it tomorrow? Is it like, you think we're next year? You think this is like a 2030 thing? I mean, it's not a stop function. It's an evolution, right? I mean, we do a lot of that 
you know, selfishly at high operator where everything we do is what can we do to make one agent produce more than one agent's worth of productivity? And we're seeing examples today where we can have one agent do, you know, five agents worth of work. And that's where it gets exciting. Right. Because the manufacturing parallel here is, you know, you, you can have assembly line workers or you can have mostly full, fully automated assembly lines with one person who's supervising a lot more work being done than they can do by personally doing all of the work. We need to figure out how to get this into homes where, the, you know, the, the homemakers can utilize this to be able to duplicate and clone themselves because that would truly be amazing. There's like, if we could figure out how to have one person accommodate five things in the home that that would be a miracle right there. <laughs> yeah, robotics, whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> the Jetsons are coming. Um, the, I, I wanna take a, a few minutes here to kind of let everybody really get to know Liz. Have you ever played the game this or that? Oh boy, I'm not great on the spot. <laughs> so this or that is, uh, it's a game where I give you two words or two phrases and you pick one that resonates most with you and you tell me why. So really easy one to start with. Show or tell? Show. I'm terrified of public speaking. <laughs> Are you really? You're so good at it. If you knew what was happening inside. <laughs> all right, all right. Now I think I know the answer to the next one as well, but I'm gonna ask anyway. Book smarts or, streets or street smarts? Street smarts. I did not see that coming. Really? That fascinates me. What's what's the reasoning behind that one? You know, it's the same as customer service, where all the technology in the world and all of the numbers in the world won't get you. Any you need the data, you need the tools, but at the end of the day, it's how you interact with other people and the experience that you create. I mean, I already mad respected you, but whole new level of respect for you right now. Um, Loose guidelines or clear directions? Clear directions. That loose one, guidelines are an invitation to find clear direction. And loose guidelines are to me an invitation for chaos. So I just, and I, I being the OCD person that I am, cannot handle chaos. So I am right there with you. So everybody, you heard it here. We are on the, the show, the street smarts and the clear directions guidelines here. Okay, back to our question. So what do you think is the future of customer experience meeting and, and merging with AI? Where do you think we're going here, especially heading into 20? I mean, we're right now at the very beginning. We're only two weeks in. By the way, Happy New Year. Uh, how do you think 2023 is going to go with customer experience and AI? Ah, 2023. I think we're seeing the beginning of a lot of really exciting potential. And I think we're going to see this shift around 2023 of theory meets reality, right? So all this cool potential, you know, you have generative text, you have, you know, a chatbot that you can have humanoid conversations with. The next big challenge is how do we apply this very specifically, very directly? And then top of mind for everyone, how do we drive business results out of it, right? I think it's going to be that shift. And two things here, I think one of them is that you know, chat GPT, it's generative AI, which means what it's really good at is taking a broad amount of information, learning from that, like if you're a really smart human who could read really, really quickly, and then learning from that and presenting something out. But if you think about customer service, customer service is very specific. You can be a customer service agent with 20 years of experience, and if you go start working at a new company, you have a whole new set of policies, procedures, and brand voice that you need to go learn, right? And ChatGPT, while a very impressive tool, is not personal and specific and contextual in that way quite yet. So I think a lot of the shakeout this next year is going to be people saying, okay, how do we take that ability to seem like a human but then combine it with the very specific policies and processes that we need to actually drive customer service results to create something that we can use that can be customer facing that our, our agents can actually use and utilize on a daily basis. I think a lot of it's going to be that. And with regard to high operator, you talked a lot about, and you mentioned cyborgs, which that just, I know that, I know we don't have cyborgs, but you talk about how you have your agents doing 
work from basically multiple people. Mm -hmm. Do you see High Operator growing substantially over the next year or two? And, you know, what do you see in it coming for High Operator? Definitely a lot of growth um, because it's really the theme that we're living in, right? Is how do you deliver great customer experience that you know moves all of your NPS and customer LTV metrics in the right direction, right? And you do need humans in the loop for that. But at the same time, how do you drive the business results of that not costing an arm and a leg, right? And there are really only a couple of ways to call it contain your customer service costs. Right. You can decrease your contacts, which can be done well. It can increase self-serve, you know, increase sort of self-serve FAQ and chatbots and things like that. You can pay people less, which is never the goal. Or you can make you can pay your agents well and use all the technology at your disposal to make them much better and faster. And that's where I think we're very aligned, where when we say, you know, a cyborg agent, right, it's really saying everything that a customer service agent does. What can we automate? Where can we rely on AI to make them better and faster so that the overall result is a lot more productivity and leverage? Well, it's exciting to see where High Operator has gotten to so far just over the last few years and where it's going. To that person that is listening right now, the one that is on the other end of the spectrum from us that is not geeking out, that is terrified and is worried that AI is going to take their job and is is going to make them, you know, just completely irrelevant to everything. Um, what would you say to them? Well, a couple of things, but I think one of them is that ChatGPT3, all of these are models that can only do things that they have learned. Right. And you as a human customer service agent, you have very specific experiences and wisdom and ability to discern intent that can't be deciphered just from reading, you know, millions of pages of web articles. Right. That's essentially what it is. Right. It's essentially saying I've ingested a whole lot of information. I don't have very much context. I don't really have a North Star, but here's what it looks like. You as a human customer service agent or attorney or whatever you are, you bring that level of experience and discernment that AI really just doesn't have for you right now, right? Now, the other thing I would say, though, and I'm maybe a little bit surprised that more companies aren't concerned about this, is, you know, there's a lot of, if you are building on top of open AI, there's a lot of vendor lock-in there. There really is no additional model out there. I think we saw this play out over the past couple of years with the Facebook API and friends data, right? Where there are a lot of apps and businesses built on the ability to use Facebook's API to grab very specific friends data and things like that. But the moment Facebook started getting negative PR around it, they pulled all of that access. So I do think that for this to really big, but be a big player, we do need to start seeing alternative options that are public. So there isn't a hundred percent vendor lock-in to something like chat GPT. Put it another way, there needs to be competition. There needs to be somebody else, not just chat GPT, that other people can use to build their platforms on as well. Absolutely. Because otherwise, I would be terrified if I was building a business purely on desire of one company to continue providing API access. There have been a few situations over the last um, two or three years, especially when the whole world was at home, when one thing went down, one thing, I, I want to say, uh, I'm not going to name names, one thing went down, and all of a sudden, all social networks were down, all, you know, like 16 different companies went down because one thing went down. And if everybody's building off of that one API, I could see that happening as well. And we can't have that kind of bottleneck going into the future. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was this, apparently a recent all hands meeting at Google where, you know, employees asked, hey, given the popularity of ChatGPT, is Google launching anything similar? Right. And I believe the Alphabet CEO actually responded and said, 
you know, yeah, Google actually has similar capabilities, but we're not making it public right now because if something goes wrong, there's a ton of reputational risk to Google, right? What you take that, you say, okay, well, what happens to all of this access with very proprietary models once we get any whiff of bad PR? That, so, so we're being driven by fear of what could happen. And Potentially. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, it makes me very curious to know how many are actually out there that simply, ha- because you, we, we now know that there's at least one, but there's definitely more that we just don't know about, but are potentially afraid to let the world know for fear of PR issues. Yeah, so. or right, it's, a, it's their competitive edge, right? <laughs> why would you, you know, short of a great PR and a viral story, why would you necessarily uncover your competitive edge? I think it's going to be a very interesting 2023, and uh, I look forward to having a very similar conversation either at the end of 2023 or at the beginning of 2024 uh, and kind of mapping to see how it looks. I am Absolutely. curious, though, you you have a lot of clients that utilize your services for this very reason. Of, do you have any case studies that, you know, without revealing client names, clearly, uh, that you can share with us about how that return on investment to just try and ease some ease some people's fears. Absolutely. Because what I will say, which is kind of interesting, and I'd be curious if you hear the same, is we rarely have clients say, I want to use AI and automation. What we hear instead is that, one, I don't want to miss out on something that can make my business better, but I'm looking for the business results. I want my customer service to be faster. We want better first response times. We want it to be more cost effective and we want it to be higher quality, right? At the end of the day, we are solving for end goals. The tool we use to get there, whether that's 90% automation and 10% AI or 50-50, isn't what business leaders, at least from what I'm hearing, that people are looking for. 100%. They're not coming to you for the tool. They're coming to you for the result. And the result is efficient, top-level, high-quality customer experience. Yeah, exactly. You don't buy a hammer. You buy the ability to do whatever you're trying to do. I bought my house. I really don't care how they made it. I just want a house with a roof over my head. Exactly. I have no interest in knowing exactly how we built that. No interest. Um, (laughs) In fact, if they start, I'm probably going to fall asleep because it's that boring to me. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And so, and and so those are some of the results that we've been able to deliver, but only because of the technology we use, right? So we've been able to take programs that are normally would be, you know, maybe a hundred age, a hundred agents worth, a hundred seats worth of customer service, right? And then we're able to use technology, automate bits and pieces of that, still leave the human customer service agent in the loop, but cut that down to something that's, you know, a 20 full-time equivalent worth of program, right? And we do invest a lot more tech in that and engineering time, but for our clients, you know, we're able to drive a ton of cost effectiveness, oftentimes, you know, sometimes cutting their costs in half almost by doing that in a way that doesn't impact customer experience. They're still getting the human in the loop. And it's in many ways higher quality because, you know, who doesn't make mistakes calculating things like price adjustments, software, and still leaving that human in the loop to deliver the end empathy and experience and conversation. Can we get a little clarity on something you just said, though? Because you said it doesn't impact customer experience, but I actually Mm -hmm. think that it does impact customer experience and it impacts it positively more so than say having a hundred agents headcount that having those 20 with your technology is actually a more positive customer experience than not impacting customer experience. Yeah, it definitely positively impacts customer service. You're, you're sure on that. We think of impact sometimes as, as negative things, but it definitely positively impacts that. Because part of it is speed, right? You're happier when you hear back from a company that you've reached out to more quickly. But some of it also is accuracy. So a very tangible example is we work with a somewhat complex device with a fairly difficult troubleshooting process. Right. And this was a huge manual that customer service agents had to go and learn in order to then troubleshoot this device with the customer. And it used to take a lot. It used to take, you know, sort of five conversational back and forth to get that customer to your resolution. 
because you know sometimes the agent would miss one particular part of what was happening and it would take a couple back and forth to get there. That honestly sounds like not just a time issue. It sounds like it's a pain in the ass is what it sounds like. Yeah, it's not fun for anyone, right? The, yeah. the customer service agent is following this giant thread of what's going on and trying to work through the matrix of, hey, how do I fix this? The customer is sitting there with a device that doesn't work and they just want to get it fixed. That, so that they're not familiar with and they're trying to answer the question, which they probably answer it some incorrectly anyway. Software is a whole lot better at mapping and understanding that manual than a human customer service agent a human customer service agent is. And so that was an example where we took that, we boiled it down to our software, automated a lot of the steps of what you check and what you read. And we've gone that down to like two and a half back and forth. It's a win for everyone. It's faster for our clients. It's faster for us. So we're making more money and they're paying less money. And it's a much more positive experience for the customer because they're getting to a working device in half the time. Wow. Right? I'm thinking of myself on the other end of that line. And I would much rather only have two, two and a half exchanges than five or six. Every single exchange that happens, I get more and more frustrated and anxious and irritated. Yeah. So that is significantly reduced, which means a better customer experience, less time, which is more a better customer experience because every customer equates their time with their money. Absolutely. You're asking them to invest in your device, right? And that's, that's a high ask. But in all of that, there's a ton of automation and, and some AI behind the scenes and digesting that and creating a better prompting system for the agent. And that's where we see as sort of the perfect orchestration of letting software do what software is great at, digesting a whole lot of information, and the agent do what the agent and humans are best at, which is providing that end experience for the customer. Along those lines, now that we've heard this, what advice would you give to the frontline teams on how to embrace that AI that you were just talking about? How to work with it instead of against it? Remember what humans are great at. Humans are great at spotting exceptions and providing empathy. And I will actually say, you know, this was a few months ago, but um, I was on the floor. We believe that every person at high operator should have some understanding of what being a customer service agent looks like. So we rotate through the floor on occasion. I was on the floor and I overheard an agent tell another agent they were working with on a pretty automated client. And they, were, they said something like, hey, you need to make sure to check these things because that is why we are the human in the loop. Sovereign can do a lot of things, but you need to be here to make sure that we're ultimately serving the customer correctly. Software provides policy, software provides recommendations, but you can't just click through. You have to be there to provide the human touch because that is how we generate value. I love that. The human I was in like, the loop. Yes. I loved that because I was like, you understand why you're here. That is the role of the human in an automated world is to provide what can't be automatically surmised from an interaction. <sighs> I mean, I, that phrase, the human in the loop, that is phenomenal. Yeah. I, it, it needs to be in all your training material. You're the human in the loop. You're critical, right? You got to make sure your uh, self-driving car doesn't drive itself into the barrier. <laughs> That's another show. That's another show. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's so true because customer service is relatively low reward, but high risk. Right. You, yeah. now, you do absolutely have opportunities to delight and go above and beyond and really solidify that experience in the customer's mind. But, you know, your average customer who just needs to process a return or a warranty, they just want that done for them. Yeah. Right. You're Let not split. Yeah. Just help me out. I've got things to get to. I'm on I'm my lunch break. Let's get this done. But customers get very upset if they're asking for an exchange and you process a return or refund. Right now, it's not anywhere near the same level as driving into your barrier, but it does mean that in customer service, we have to almost go above and beyond to be human and avoid making mistakes because that's what the consumer is judging you and the company that you're supporting on. Well, Liz, this has been great. And I really appreciate you joining us on Unexpected Journey, uh, the conversation about AI and automation. And uh, I really do look forward to, to having it again in a year to see kind of where 2023 took us. Uh, so question, why would our guests want to reach out to you or why would they reach out to you? And two, how would they reach out to you? 
<laughs> so reach out if you're excited about how you accomplish automation and you want to get end results of automation when it comes to customer service. Um, we, yes, provide, you know, a tech enabled outsourced customer service experience, but we think about customer service all day, every day. And we're always excited to just chat about that and talk about what you're seeing and what the correct applications and highest leverage applications are for automation and AI. And, you know, you can find me at highoperator.com for the company on online or on LinkedIn, or just email me at liz at highoperator.com. Always happy to chat. Perfect. And uh, as we have always said, we will have links to in the description of the show. And we look forward to seeing everybody again next week. As we wrap the episode up, we would like to take this time to thank you for joining us this week on Unexpected Journey. Our guest's information will be linked in the episode description, along with a link to our company website, remoteevolution.com, and our host website, anbib.com. Please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share on your favorite podcast app and on our YouTube channel so that you never miss an episode and we can continue to bring them to you. Let us know your thoughts on what we discussed in the comment section. And once again, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again next week for another episode of Unexpected Journey.